last year, Mike Stefanik won the big NASCAR modified race at Watkins Glen, the first time these cars had raced here in years. They came back in June. Stefanik started the race, but then jumped out to go run a Bush North car at Nazareth. He's won six races this year and has a big point lead. Mike Stefanik did double duty again yesterday. In fact, he finished second in another Bush North race, but he qualified four hours prior to everyone else. In fact, he qualified so well, he stuck it on the pole. Former footballer Tim Connolly starts up front today. He won the modified race here in June by just a third of a second over Rick Fuller and started on a roll. Three wins in four starts. Watch the Tidy Cat car because Connolly is determined to make it two in a row today and watch him win. Yes, Connolly proved that June was no fluke. He's going to start on the outside of row number one. The Tidy Cat car can stay very clean if it can stay out of the kitty litter. The creed of the modified division is simple. Go fast, turn left, under the division slogan by the grace of God at 600 horsepower. Today, the challenge is go fast, turn right, and keep the wheels on it for 150 kilometers at Watkins Glen. Yes, and there are a total of 34 cars that want to beat out those front two on the front row. And it's all coming up at Watkins Glen International. Come to Watkins Glen, New York today. It's the NASCAR Featherlight Modified Tour here for the Ruffles 150. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Despain along with Benny Parsons. We welcome you to what should be a very enjoyable and exciting 150 kilometers of racing. Did you know that NASCAR, the name now synonymous with stock car racing, didn't have any stock cars in their first year 49 years ago? All they ran was modified. Benny? 49 years later, we got modified on a road course, and that ought to be exciting. Well, last year was the first year for the modified year at Watkins Glen, and you could tell that the drivers nor the cars lacked road racing skills. But it's your 10 months later, in June we had a modified race, and folks, it was a terrific race. The cars were great, the drivers were even better, and I think we'll see more of the same today. A racing writer for a Chicago paper made the observation that Formula One could have learned something from that June race. Let's talk about the battle for the championship. Well, it's not much of a battle at all. A big lead for Mike Stefanik as he looks for his third career championship. More to the point, he's chasing two titles, this one and also the Bush North Championship of NASCAR. He's on the pole today for what should be a pretty spectacular 150 clicks. We invite you to stay tuned. The Ruffles 150 coming up from legendary Watkins Glen right after the break. Back at Watkins Glen International, impressive field of 34 NASCAR Featherlight modified tour cars touring this 12 turn, two and a half mile course. Riding along here with Tim Conley as we take a look at your starting lineup. Conley on the outside of the front row alongside the pole sitter, Mike Stefanik, who qualified in a minute and 13 seconds. Rick Fuller starts inside row two with Jan Leedy, the most recent winner on the tour. Outside, and then the defending series champion, Tony Hirschman, inside row three with Dan Avery flanking him. Mike Iwanitsko climbs out of the truck and into the modified to start inside row four with John Preston on the outside. Ted Christopher, seventh in the truck race, flanked by Bill Wood starting next. Back in row six, Tim Airy and Charlie Pastriak. In row seven this afternoon, Eddie Flimke and Chris Kopech. Back in row eight, Tom Trevino and Sam Russo. In row nine, Tony Ferranti Jr. and Frank Bordwick. In row 10, Reggie Ruggiero and Burt Marvin. 21st starting spot to Ed Kennedy with Tiger Tom Baldwin alongside. Then Carl Pastor Yak, flanked by Doug French. Jamie Tomanos run this series from the get-go. And Dan Kurjewski is next in line. S.J. Vonchen flanked by Rick Neary. Wade Cole 
and Maggie McGee, the last guys who qualified on time. There's Jake Morose, provisional at Conneran, Buddy Norton, and Potrzebowski. It's all yours, buddy. I do. That's why we did them that way, so you could do the provisionals. There's the course, actually 2.45 miles the distance, 12 turns, and a tough place to pass, Benny. Very tough. Going in turn one is a great place to pass. Coming off this corner, getting positioned into turn 11, which is the left-hander, that's a good place to pass. And they got, these guys would be familiar with that left-hander. Taking a look at your race in Alice Bowl speed, nearly 120 miles an hour. They'll go 38 laps. They will have a competition yellow, meaning that they will come in, fuel the cars, and as long as they make no other changes on the cars, they return to the track in the same position. A competition yellow. These cars are typically not geared for pit stops, and uh, so in order to keep the cost of competition down, they're going to go with that competition yellow. Some people like it, some people don't. Bottom line, I think it's probably the most fair way to deal with an event where the guys are running on a course that's very different from their norm. And if you don't have a flat, you cannot change the tire. And obviously you can't change the tire on the caution. If it's flat, you can, but if the tire's not flat, you got to go all the way on. Should be an interesting battle into turn one because the guys who are fighting for the championship are lined up side by side on the front row. The green is out and we're underway. And Stepanek gets a great jump from the pole. Rick Fuller comes with him in the second spot. And that's going to drop Conley in the yellow car to third right off the bat. Will they all get through turn one? Hang on. And looks like Burt Marvin 07 was over in the dirt. But all cars. And we got a car up against the wall up in the start of the S's. Trouble early, turn one not completed before they ran into difficulty, and we got one parked up there. That's Kopech, who has slapped the outside wall as they made the entrance down into the S's, and he's done some pretty heavy damage to the left front. We see there's no left front there, and there's a full course car, and Fuller has taken the lead from Stefani. Rick Fuller seizing the moment here. He narrowly missed the victory in the June race. Wasted no time getting out front of this one, but it is a full course yellow, so they will quickly come back down to caution flag speed. Heads up move there by Fuller after Kopech slapped the wall in turn two. Let's see if we can see. There he is, and the left front wheel is going along, dancing on the, it goes up by the Zippo board. Wow. Hmm. I, didn't see, I, I just didn't see the start of that to tell. And we've got cars up in the S's. Christopher is one of the cars involved in that, and that is a big disappointment. After his seventh place run in the truck race, Doug French also has damaged his car, and whether or not this might have been in the course of making evasive moves to try to get away from uh, what happened to Kopech remains to be seen. There's Teddy. Boy, Frustration, you bet. A year Man. ago, this race, Axel broke, spit the left wheel off, cost him a potential victory. Now today, he doesn't even get through lap one. And then he falls off the fence. I mean, to Ted, cap, I'd call it a day. To cap it all off, he fell off the fence. I'd Man. quit. Now he's got to be worn out after racing the truck for the first time in his career. I mean, he didn't just finish seventh, but it's the first time he'd been in a truck. Now, trouble at the S's for Ted Christopher. Well, we'll get an early opportunity to start burning up those commercial breaks. We're under the first full course yellow. The Ruffles 150 at Watkins Glen International. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're back at the Ruffles 150 in Watkins Glen, where the start of the race has been marred by two accidents, perhaps related, perhaps not, that have taken four cars out of the field so it wasn't a, a very pretty opening here that's jake morose a little morose about the way things have gone here early rick fuller is the happiest guy in the joint because he got the drop on the pole sitter there's a look at how the cars shape up 364 cubic inch average the compression ratio is 12 to 1 uh, around 575 to 600 horsepower and they weigh 2610 to 3200 now that is with the driver and the cubic inch reflects how much the cars weigh Power to weight, critical and impressive for these little cars. I mean, they make an awful lot of power per pound, and we'll get around one of these racetracks in a very big hurry. But, of course, these racetracks are very much different from the courses on which they normally contest, and we got some opinions about that before the race. 
Well, a year ago, it was my first debut on a road course. I've never raced a road course before we came here to Watkins Glen. Um, from then to this year, I've learned how to turn right, step on the gas and the clutch and the brake at the same time. And it's just all a big learning curve for the modified guys. It's definitely one thing with the modifieds, uh, not running a road course often. This is our third time here. It's pretty much a learning curve every lap we do out there. Uh, you know, the biggest thing is, uh, I think uh, I was listening to Ron Fellows actually in a truck meeting this morning, and uh, he was telling us, you know, to downshift, get everything done before the corner, and then, you know, work on getting out of the corner good. And, uh, you know, that's what we've been working on today. Well, I have an interesting perspective on that because I'm my car owner as well as my car driver. And uh, as a car driver, I was just dying to get here and race. But as the owner, it's uh, been quite a proposition, a little bit expensive, and of course, anytime you're learning, uh, that costs a few dollars too for testing and so forth. So from that standpoint, I've got a mixed view. I hope that in June, I, I learned enough about um, the little tricks of this place that it, it's gonna pay dividends. Um, right now, I'm watching Mike Stefanik. He's, he's pretty quick. Uh, matter of fact, uh, he's a whole bunch quicker than we are. We've learned we can take advantage of the rules a little more than we're allowed to. And uh, it really hasn't showed up this time because we're down on power, but a couple of our other cars, Reggie, Ferrante, and, and, and uh, the kid in the 26, we've learned that we can push a couple different places, and we've picked up a little bit there. So uh, if, if you're watching, Ed Cox, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Cox is the tour director and uh, pays close attention to observations like that. So the wreckers hooked up to Moreau's car and pulled it away. Christopher's car is still sitting there on the racetrack as the field still circul circulates around the racetrack on the caution flag. We will uh, ride along with the former Ithaca College star quarterback Tim Conley today from what was second starting position, but he didn't get the tidy cat car hustled up to speed very quickly there, Benny, and uh, will restart third. That'll give you a pretty good view of the current series point leader and the current series race leader when they get this baby back under green, which will be shortly. The infinite variety of NASCAR, the modifieds here today, the Winston Cup cars at Darlington. Next weekend, we'll kick off our coverage with qualifying on Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock Eastern time. The run for the pole with Benny Parsons and the rest of the team. The big race on Sunday of Labor Day weekend as Jeff Gordon tries to bounce back from last night's disappointment at Bristol and win a million bucks in the Southern 500. Benny, that was a big blow for Gordon last night. Yes, it was, and Darlton is going to be different this week. You know, they flip-flopped the straightaways. What used to be the back stretch is now the front stretch, and how we're going to get used to that after been going down there since 1970, I don't know, but we'll try our best. She's an all-new Darlington, and I feel confident that you guys will be all over it. Meanwhile, they race trucks in NASCAR, and today Ron Fellows, the former Trans Am champion, came home a winner. Only the third time this year that he's raced a truck, but he's a road racing ace, and he held off Mike Bliss, the former USAC champion, who had a strong run to second. Jack Sprague, the division leader, third to extend his point lead over Ron Hornaday, who crashed in uh, practice, totaled the truck, bent up his rib cage a little bit, still ran top five. Tough cat. Ted Christopher, as we said, seventh in the truck race, but crashing on the first lap of the modified competition here today. Rick Johnson, Blaze Alexander, and Rick Corelli rounding out the top 10. That in the Parts of America 150, which finished just a little over a half hour ago here. And I hope you had the opportunity to see that on ESPN Classic. If not, watch for the re-air here on the deuce. One of the most impressive things about Ron Fellows winning that race, he stopped for fuel and had to go to the rear, of the, well, not the rear of the field, but at least back in the 20s position, 20 to 30th position, and fought his way from there back to the front. So it's not a walk in the park with the classic road racing passes en route to doing that. But I'll tell you what, I was impressed with Bliss. I expect a Ron Fellows to go fast at a place like this, but uh, Bliss was pretty impressive today en route to second place. We've been given the indication that we will go green next time by. And so we'll see if Rick Fuller can make that pass on the pole sitter stick. NASCAR Featherlight Tour going to Stafford Motor Speedway on August 29th. That's one of their classic venues. And I'll tell you what, New Hampshire International Speedway, you know about it for Winston Cup cars. It was built for these guys. It these was, guys just love that place. I mean, that is their Daytona loudness there. 
Daytona, please modify it. Remaining schedule, Flemington, Thompson, and Richmond International Raceway, November the 1st, around the three-quarter mile at Richmond International Raceway. That uh, second race at Stafford, by the way, will be on ESPN2, so uh, we'll look forward to having another opportunity to cover these great cars from up there. You see a few hands waving there. That's because the lights have come back on on the pace car. Apparently, they've found a little more uh, debris up there in the S's after this first turn melee. So let's slide in one more of a commercial break here, confident that there won't be much more yellow. Those heat waves are a little bit deceptive because uh, it's not all that warm here, but the sun is cooking right down on the racetrack. It's cleared up a good bit. We had a threat of rain for late this afternoon, but now that has cleared, and that's good news. There you can see that McGee took a bit of a dent in the nose and uh, apparently has dinged the radiator. All right, this time let's do it clean and green. After five laps of caution, Rick Fuller gets the drop on the pole center, Stefanik, and we're back underway as they head for turn one. Conley and Leedy hang on to third and fourth, and here comes the scramble for position behind them. That's better. So far, so good as Fuller goes up to the S's. The long uphill run goes well for Fuller. Here's Stefanik looking inside as they go to the inner loop. A nice pass. Textbook. Oh, we got some trouble for the 37 car. Uh, D.J. Potrabowski. How come you get all the good names, Benny? The Elmira, New York runner has already made one pit stop, so apparently this is a continuation of a problem that began earlier. And look at Conley looking on the inside of the left-hander as these modifieds drafted. is critical on these modifieds because they cut such a hole in the air. They're able to ride in that draft as Fuller smokes that right front with the brakes. Well, Fuller got the best of the first start, but the pole center, Stefanik, has retaken the lead here, trying to make it two in a row in the fall race in Washington, the August race. Didn't fare so well here in June. Had quite a saga in June that we'll get into, I'm sure, before we're finished. Boy, he's using all the road there as he heads into the S's. And so is Conley. Making some real late entry in the corners. Trying to make them as straight as they possibly can. Or as round as they possibly can. And here's Conley. And he and Fuller trying to hook up and draft by. It looks like they'll get it done. That was nice. And Conley's going to get paid off as well. He gets the help, uh, gives the help to Fuller to get him through, and then was able to grab second spot in the exchange. Stefanik will fall to third. And continuing to run in that fourth spot is leading. Just kind of sitting back watching those lead trios scramble it up and scramble it up pretty well, I would add. A lot of passing. That's good. Fast left-hander. And these cars cannot use the Jericho, the road racing transmission. Rule says to specify they've got to use the transmission like they're using their cars on Saturday night. So there's not a lot of shifting with a modified. They don't go to second gear. A lot of, and a battle for the lead. Conley trying to outbreak Fuller in one, and he does it. Check it out. Three laps of green. we got three different leaders. It's the Tidy Cat car going out front. Well, the boy knows how to win on this course. He did it in June, and he beat the guy who's currently right behind him by less than this interval. About a third of a second separated these two cars in June. As a matter of fact, uh, that was his very first NASCAR Featherlight Modified Tour victory. As Fuller goes for the lead, tries to draft by, he'll try to get by Conley, and he does it. Wow. I'll tell you what, after watching the truck race, which was somewhat more processional than this, I am impressed with the modified. These boys are not afraid to make a pass. Now Tom is going to draft by Fuller in turn 10. You don't see this pass all that frequently at Watkins Glen. He made it very nicely. Got a good jump. And you got to get a good jump off that corner because that straightaway is not that long. Now the last time Rick Fuller was able to pass down in turn one. Can he do it again? Yeah, we'll know in a moment. Here they come, hammering down that long front straightaway and downhill into turn one, which makes the braking all the more treacherous. Fuller didn't get alongside that time, and so Conley will hang on to the spot. 
Conley wasn't just a quarterback at Ithaca. He was a good quarterback. He was a pro prospect, but unfortunately, knee injuries took him out of that. And he said, man, I'm still a pretty competitive guy. i got to find another outlet for those juices. I'll go racing. And he's Fuller. He's being passed right now by Fuller. What a great battle, folks. I tell you, it was just like this in June. It continues on in August. Tell you, what a comparison to a year ago when it was all these guys could do to get a lap in without having some kind of terrible trouble. First lap didn't go well, but since then, they've been swapping the lead like it was Saturday night. When we talked about the New Hampshire International Raceway. That's exactly what they do at New Hampshire, and this time, Fuller was able to maintain the lead, but they used the draft in New Hampshire, and you see three or four lead changes per lap. They ran their last, uh, last race in fact and had 24 lead changes at start finish in 25 laps doesn't get a whole lot better than that here they are side by side Conley will go back to the lead over Fuller Stefanik just being smart here laying back I would think he is yes just making sure that making sure that everything is going to be okay the tires going to be okay he has not uh, made any effort to improve on his position. That blue car sitting in fifth spot is Tony Hirschman, the two-time and defending champion, as the lead is again in question coming into the uh, inner loop. And Leedy, ooh, Jan Leedy in the 25 was taking a look at first Fanning to get by and take over that third spot, not able to do it. Leedy says, Mike, we're missing all the fun up there, buddy. Let's go tangle it up with the two top guys. Field summer running all the way back through the field. And as another challenge comes to the lead, let's go to Marty on Pit Road. One thought, one thought I want to throw out for both of you. Tire wear. With the offset of these race cars, especially on the right-hand corners, drivers have been telling us that the left front or the left rear, depending on how much air pressure you're running, can wear. Benny, question for you. Is Mike Stefanik, the smartest guy in the bunch, just laying back, letting these guys duke it out up front and maybe wearing these out? Well, Marty, he might be the smartest guy in the bus, but thank goodness these other two guys, if that's the case, they are too smart. Because, folks, I'm loving it. <laughs> I tell you what, this is what race is all about. Pass the guy in front of you. Go for the lead. Get to the front. Good show so far. Ruffles 150 at Watkins Glen. More in a moment. Working lap 11 at Watkins Glen. McGee Miller's bad day has gotten worse. Well, they're going to get her out of the kitty litter there, and uh, he'll be able to press on. Don't need the uh, don't need the truck, but we do have the yellow, and we indicated that uh, there would be a competition yellow once they were into the fuel window, and this has been declared that, Benny. So uh, we'll make good use of this caution. Well, period. next time by, these cars will will have completed 12 laps, and you said the. The length of the race today is 38 laps, so surely they can run 25 laps, 25, 26 laps on a tank of fuel. So, good idea by NASCAR to proclaim this the competition yellow and let the guys come in, make some adjustments on their cars, put some fuel in it, and run to the end. Can they, in fact, adjust on the cars? I don't, I don't think, think they can, can they? Maybe the only fuel is all they can do. The issue, of course, uh, as we indicated earlier, is keeping the cost of competition down. There's Jan Lady currently in fourth, having won at uh, New Hampshire last weekend. 24 lead changes, but the one that matters most is the last one, and it was Lady who grabbed the top spot on a racetrack where he just loves to compete. Today, he sits in fourth and has been there from the get-go. I loved his uh, observation at the top about uh, how owners and drivers look at things differently, and when, you, when you're both, then you're kind of schizophrenic. I mean, this racetrack, a road course for a driver, is the absolute most fun you'll ever have in a race car. But as he said, for an owner, it is, it's expensive because you got to have better brakes than you normally have, transmissions. Although you can't use Jericho, they probably do buy some kind of T10 transmission or work on them to try to help them be road racing transmissions. I recall last year when we were up here, a lot of guys were talking about it. Even though they had made an effort to limit the changes they could make in the cars, they were talking about having spent five, six, seven thousand dollars above what their normal weekly expense would be. Wednesday, we're going to Winchester. We got the sprint cars for you at 9:30 Eastern time on Thunder. That'll be live in the following week. 
We're going to wrap up our Thunder season for 1997 live from Terre Haute, Indiana, with the Midgets doing it in the dirt. That's a fun, fun race. 100 lapper to uh, wrap up the campaign. And so the cars will come down pit road. Attention of the crews. Get that splash of gasoline. Typically in this form of competition, you throw green, shovel in fourth gear, and away they go. Let's go to uh, let's go to Marty. Yes, and everybody's uh, waiting here. Here comes Connolly in the uh, tidy cat car and. Just to update you, you can make changes. In fact, if you look at the left front, they're going to make a stagger adjustment uh, on the left front of Connolly's car as uh, they're also adding the fuel. And right in front of him is the 21 car of Rick Fuller. Now, it doesn't look like they are making any significant changes on that machine. I'm taking a peek right now. It looks like a little small adjustment, perhaps, up at the right front. But uh, that was it. They filled it up with fuel. Remember, no rush here as long as you get back out before they're ready to go racing green again. You can go get back in your original starting position. And uh, it looks like the 21, Rick Fuller's pulling out right behind him, is the four of Tom Connolly. So the traditional race off pit road that we see at Winston Cup, not an issue here. They will be realigned in the position they were running when the yellow came out. And these are bias flat tires, not radial tires, but bias flat. So you can, in fact, change the stagger on these tires, the size of the tires. You cannot, however, change the tires themselves. They get one set for the distance. With any luck at all, that's all we'll see these cars on Pit Road. We'll be right back. Labor Day weekend finds the PPG Car World Series in Canada. The Molson Indy Vancouver. Alessandro Zip Zanardi, the defending pole sitter. Michael Andretti, the defending champion of the race. We'll find out who wins it this year on Sunday, August the 31st. Airtime is 5 o'clock Eastern on ESPN Classic. That's going to be a monster racing weekend. A little uh, incident here during the exchange of pit stops as Bill Woods was apparently uh, bumped from the rear by Eddie Flemke. Stopped unexpectedly on the racetrack and uh, got dinged by one of the guys that uh, has been around this series from the get-go. In fact, his dad was uh, one of the pioneer modified drivers. Yeah, I guess they bumped. Oh, and look in. That's 11. <laughs> Flipke is 11 car, and he has to back over the nerf bar of the 51 car. There we go. He backs over the nerf bar, and can, now he will continue on his way. Bill, I'm sorry to be doing this to you, but I'm stuck here. I need to get my race car moving again. And the 11 car is something that won't roll, so they're going to have to pick it up with a wrecker and try to ro get it back to the pit area. Bill Woods out of Nichols, New York, the Woods Machine and Tool Chevrolet. Don't ask me how they determine which is a Chevrolet and which is a Pontiac. Yeah, something to do with the roof, right? You got a lot of nerve calling these Chevrolets and Pontiacs, I'll tell you that. <laughs> division started uh, way back in 1948 and they had one of their best races ever here in June it was a pretty interesting uh, weekend for all of these drivers as they made their second appearance here at Watkins Glen it was a great race there we see Stefani his car was crashed and he had to drive this car that Curtis Markham had qualified he started the race jumped out and Markham jumped in the car and finished the race. I got to go to Nazareth. I got to go run the Bush North Series. I'm trying to win two championships. Let me out of here. And he ran. And here was the battle we saw all day between Conley and Fuller. This looks familiar. This is videotape. This is June. This is not today. Fuller getting by that time. But he couldn't make it stick. Conley won it by that much right there. I think the official margin was 33 hundredths of a second. And so the Purina folks celebrate the Tidy Cat car one. Now the Tidy Cat car is back and in the lead over Rick Fuller. And it's, I love saying it, deja vu all over again. Look at that pretty sky back there. Got those black clouds all moved out of the way. And the sun is shining brightly on this division, which has such a wonderful history. It's interesting, Benny, because they ran for so many years all these track championships at, uh, at racetracks that are so much a part of American history, but the touring series itself is actually only 10 years old. We're going to take a commercial break and come back as they clean up this last little bit of mess and then get back to green at Watkins Glen. We're going to go green here and see if this 
lead swapping duel at Watkins Glen will continue. Conley gets a good drop on Fuller. They head back down to turn one. Stefanik, the defending race champion, and Leedy, the most recent winner on the tour, deployed there in third and fourth. The defending series champion in the blue car, Tony Hirschman, rides in fifth. The big guns are all up front, and the tidy cat car got a pretty nice drop on him right there. But this is this back stretch is a front stretch or whatever. Going into turn five is the favorite place for Rick Fuller to take the lead. And here he's off. <laughs> I thought he was. Well, he says, eh, maybe not. Maybe this isn't going to work this time. So through the inner loop, he will follow Conley. Biggest lead of the race so far right there, four car lengths. Fuller won the series opener at Thompson, Connecticut, the race they call the Icebreaker, and has since won another race at Thompson for his two victories on the season. Conley got all excited after he won the race here in June, went out and won again the following week in New Hampshire, and then two weeks after that in Holland, New York, for three victories in four starts to get him into the thick of this championship battle. Here comes Rick. Well, couldn't quite make that pass. He said, well, I think I'll just wait to my favor. Oh, and Conley oh, goes off in the dirt. Did he save it? Yes, he did. Well, he... yes, he did. I think I was a little early on the call. <laughs> yes, I did, too. <laughs> it ain't saved till it's saved. He finally got it gathered back up. You see uh, Carino go slipping by. So the first major position change in the top three finds Conley nearly into, dare I say it, the kitty litter. And we see Conley just getting the corner a little bit too hard with the four car. And there it goes. Ooh. Fuller goodbye. And Stefanik by. And a host of others, <laughs> as they say. So Stefanik is now just a car out of the lead, but that car is Rick Fuller, and it's a good one. Second ranked in the championship standings as we come in here. Badly wants to win that title. His car owner has never won the crown, and so it's a very big uh, motivator for Stefanik, or for Rick Fuller, I should say. Rick won the title in 1993. Watch this one very, very much. And Conley has fallen back to the fifth spot, it looks like, with his off-track excursion down in turn one. And I'll bet he's tickled to be fifth, because yes. that could have been a whole lot worse. Here he comes, just flashing across your screen up the right-hand corner. This will elevate Hirschman to fourth. We speak of car owners. He drives for the legendary Lenny Bowler as the top three battle up front, the blue car of which you get glimpses. The only owner ever to win three championships. Change the lead for the first time. Stefanik gets back out front. He just been laying back there waiting and said, well, okay, the, this, we're out the, this is the pace I want to run. you are run a little bit slower than I want to. I think I'll take the lead and go on. Let's see. Can Fuller catch back up to Stefanik? And what will Leedy do now? He's had Stefanik to follow around here for the first uh, 16 laps of competition and obviously feeling pretty comfortable in so doing. Will he now move up and take a crack at Rick Fuller? Fuller family, of course, very much a part of the history of this division. We know about Jeff, who moved on to Bush Grand National Competition. There's Tony Hirschman. He won the title the last... Oh, look out, Tony. Don't flick the old blue into the fence there. That's a famous race car. Lenny Bowler's been racing that car, I believe I heard, eight years. Does that seem possible? Old Blue's won a bunch, including the last two championships. Won it by... The narrowest of margins in 1995, three points over a guy named Steve Park, and then came back and won it again last year over Park. You know Park's story. He now drives for that Earnhardt guy. The four-car, Tim Conner, the golf course just a moment ago, the last lap, the leader ran a little over 117 miles an hour. He ran a little over 118 miles per hour. So he is, Conley is the fastest car on the racetrack of the first five currently. 
and you can see the consequence on the racetrack. You get a glimpse there as he closes up on the blue car of Tony Hirschman. There he is, about three car lengths back and coming after him in a very big hurry. With 17 of 38 in the book, there's still plenty of time for him to do business. We've seen how well these guys can pass on this racetrack. Conley just needs to stay cool, take his time. We'll take you back through the field. Even it's going eighth spot after a 21st place finish in the truck race. Pretty impressive. Frank Bordwick has spun the Kaufman tree service Chevrolet without apparent damage. There he gets her fired. Get her going, Frank. We don't need to see that yellow anymore. All that distance that he loses. Let's see if we can tell what happened to the 24 cars. Tony Ferranti, the 31, is following. And he just didn't make the corner. The left-hander. And through the dirt. This is where Ron Hornaday flipped the other day in practice. And Ricky Rudd here in the NASCAR Winston Cup cars were here for the butt at the Glen. He did a nice job of keeping that thing out of the fence. Uh -oh, and he, uh, now he did not keep it out of the fence this time. Bordwick obviously hurt the car in some way. Got her fired back up. Said, I'll get that yellow yet. And leaves pieces of his machine strung along the exit of turn 12 and out onto the front straightaway. And then we see the left front tire Lynn, we're in the middle of the racetrack. Let's see if we can tell what happens. Here comes Bordwick. And all of a sudden, something had to break in the rear. Something that, dry, that, that holds the rear end true broke and smashes the inside wall hard. Yeah, I'll bet. And look at this whole wheel and assembly. That spindle, brake rotor, caliper. That was a heavy blow. So the obvious question, what was the connection between the first incident and the second? The key issue is that Bordwick is up and out of the car. Yes, he is sitting on top of the wall, jumps out. There's something in the rear broke. There's no doubt about that. They just turned the car toward the inside wall. Boy, he whacked that thing. So they'll look him over, make sure that uh, he knows that it's Sunday and this is Watkins Glen. Yeah. All he's thinking right now is dollar signs. My race car is tore up. Did you see that? What a classic. My race car is tore up. Huge disappointment for Fordwick. What a blessing, though, for those who pay the bills. We'll be right back. Just past the midpoint of the Ruffles 150, back under yellow for the incident involving Frank Bordwick of Keyport, New Jersey here. The remains of Frank's car wedged in under the guardrail, and here's how it happened. He's going down the front straightaway, and something in the rear brake that just turns, brakes that just turns the car into the inside wall. Heavy contact. We can see just knock the left rear completely off the car. That's the brake, the wheel, the spindle, everything. And he goes back into the wall and see the car still trying to go forward. Evidently, the car's still in gear. And there's some of the some of the pieces, Marty. Yeah, what you're looking at is at the left front, or what is left of it. I mean, it's looked like a pretzel here. And then if you come around, you'll see that the whole spindle assembly has just been snapped. Uh, awfully, awfully hard impact. But I can tell you, I saw Frank climb into the ambulance on his own power. In fact, he was inspecting damage. Seemed to be okay. We'll wait for the official report. I remember this all transpired, what, Benny, two corners after he had gone off at a real fast part of the racetrack, got off, actually slid through the gravel trap, saved the car, kept it off the wall, got it turned the wrong way, but stopped on the road, put it back in gear, and obviously was accelerating back up to speed when whatever broke, broke. I guess in retrospect, he'd have been better off to park it, but Obviously, when he left the scene of that first incident, he felt like the car was uh, was healthy beneath him, and away he went. Boy, that was a wallop. So, as you can see, the uh, field being guided past the incident through the debris. Coming up on the 50th anniversary of Watkins Glen, and they're doing something special here in town. They've started a major fundraising effort for the local library. That's right, the library. 49 years this racetrack has been here. They're going to do a major expansion at the library and document the history of racing at Watkins Glen. 
the expansion will be a 5,000 square foot addition to this current building, and uh, most of which will be dedicated to the Watkins Glen Motor Racing Research Library. There will be a film room and a video room and a print gallery. There will be um, archives, books, um, magazines, um, and a special room that will be set aside for viewing and studying these historic papers for people who are really interested in, in seeing firsthand some of the correspondence and some of the primary materials for the history of racing. Of course, in the old days, the racetrack ran right down through the heart of town, and uh, when they started racing here in 1948, it was a whole lot different world than it is now. This is a scene reminiscent of what we see here at the Butt at the Glen when they bring over 100,000 people in here and pack the place for what is now the biggest race in the history of this old racetrack. Stefanik, the pole sitter and defending champion, leads the show. Run you back through the field. Reg Ruggiero in 12th spot. Finally won a race this year. I'd begun to think he was never going to win one again. He was longtime tops on the all-time win list, but now has been passed by Stefanik for that honor. Take you on back through. You see Boardwick was in 25th spot when his problems began. I'm disappointed to see Tiger Tom Baldwin so far back in the field. I love watching him get up there and mix it up, Benny. So as the uh, barbecue continues and the cleanup too, the kids are gathered for the restart. We'll get to that, we hope, quickly. Back at Watkins Glen, where a terrific race has been interrupted by another unfortunate yellow. And now they are contemplating potential damage to the Armco barrier here, which, uh, and that has the potential to be bad news, Benny. You never like to see them beat up the fence, but uh, don't rely on our long-distance view. Marty's right down there in the thick of it, probably being a pest and getting in the way. Marty, what are you doing down there? Well, actually, I'm still behind the wall. I'm not out on the racetrack, right, but we are good. a little bit closer. Uh, we're right up against the wall, uh, over the wall from the uh, pit lane. And you can see that there is a, an area right at the base of it that is open and that they are coming down to expect that, to see whether or not, in fact, Dennis Huth is running down one of the NASCAR officials to take a look and determine whether or not they have to repair or replace this section, which would take an awfully long time, or whether or not it's safe enough for everybody to go. From here, it looks like it's just the bottom section, and I don't think that's wide enough for any car to get through there, uh, but it's NASCAR's call, obviously. Here's what did the damage when Bordwick's car turned left. It really clobbered that metal railing. The car suffered substantially, and so did the wall. I would call it, uh, well, I think the wall probably gets the nod. The car is damaged more badly than the, uh, than the barrier, but the NASCAR officials are concerned and want to get a first-hand eyewitness look from the top guy to make a call on whether or not they should try to do something in the way of a repair or allow the race to resume. And that's a tough one. I see a pickup just went by down the front stretch taking a load of tires down there, so maybe they're thinking about stacking some tires in that spot uh, on the bottom of the Armco as we ride along with the cars that was Tim Conley, we were riding along with for a moment. The tidy cut car was leading the race and goes down in turn one, four or five laps ago, and missed a corner, got off in the grass, and lost four spots. Now back in fifth spot. And uh, gaining, gaining dramatically. There's Dan Avery in the 10 moving through as you watch the field of cars. Double zero is Tim Airy. There's the golf car of Iwanitska, or uh, Ruggiero. Of Ruggiero, rather. 75 is Carl Pastriak weaving back and forth. It's a great looking field of cars, and boy, they put on such spectacular shows, typically running on the little bull rinks on Saturday night. And that's where this division has shown for so many years. We mentioned the fact that they didn't actually organize it into a championship tour until 10 years ago. And it was kind of right at the end of Richie Evans' reign as the king of the modifieds. He was the first tour champion although he won track championships and main events forever prior to that. The red flag is coming out, so apparently they are going to make a repair down there on the fence area. They're going to stop the field, 
Again, we're back to the fuel issue here. They don't want them just running around out there until they run them out of gas. So, and also, obviously, the uh, the spectators pay to see a race. And this kid says, well, heck, I'm going to go find a toy to play with until they start those cars back up again. I believe they're going to go for the temporary repair with the tires here. And that shouldn't take all that long, I don't believe. Of course, the most recent graduate of this division is one Steve Park, and he was very prominent in your weekend, Benny. Yes, he was. Never see Jimmy Spencer, who was Mr. X7, got his name. Mr. X7 from these very modified. That's Spencer in 20, Park in three. As they battle the last lap at Bristol on Friday night, Spencer and Park coming off the corner, and Mr. Excitement won the NASCAR Bush Series race at Bristol on Friday night, and we see them jumping up and down. They're happy. Steve Park comes by and says, well, congratulations, Jimmy. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Jimmy Spencer, the only guy ever to win back-to-back -back championships in this division, did it in 1986 and 1987. Goes on to win the Food City 250 over Steve Park, who didn't manage a championship, came very, very close twice, and has now graduated to the big race down south. Let's go to Marty. Yeah, they're just about ready to kick us out of here. Look how quickly they have gotten this done. They've taken tires and chained them to the supports behind the fence. So we're ready to go racing again, guys. Time for me to get back on the other side of the wall. Well, I like that. Use your head, come up with a solution, and do it in a hurry. Yeah, good idea. We're going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll be ready to drop the green and get this thing going again at Watkins Glen. Hello there. Labor Day weekend in Darlington, South Carolina. The Southern 500 will be memorable for Jeff Gordon's attempt to win the Winston Million. They'll run for the poll on Friday at 3 o'clock Eastern time. We'll have that for you live on ESPN2, followed by the race coverage itself on Sunday. We'll have happy hour on Saturday afternoon. We will obviously cover it like a blanket at the Mountain Dew Southern 500. It includes Gordon's run for the big bucks and his attempt to get back on track in terms of the championship. Mark Martin took a big bite out of his point lead last night when Gordon slapped the wall. He didn't take a big bite out of it. He chomped it. Chomped he it. went right by him, and I think Mark Martin's, what, 13 points in the lead now Eight over Jeff Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's, that's one of those cases where we try to be objective, but Mark Martin is a guy who's worked a long time for this championship, really wants to win it for Roush, and I think with the car change coming next year, probably figures he needs to win it this year. So that was a very big night for him. A very big day thus far for Conley as he has uh, led the race, has been involved in a terrific lead swapping battle, has narrowly missed the gravel trap in turn one, and has now battled back to be a contender for the victory from fifth spot with the defending series champion Tony Hirschman just in front of him. The defending race champion Mike Stefanik sitting out front Stefanik at one point this year led the championship standings in both divisions, the Featherlight Modified Tour, which we enjoy here today, and also the Bush Grand National North Championship Series. He's trying to win them both, and Benny's got a very real shot at doing that. He really does. A very realistic shot. He worked hard for it, too, by uh, missing one race, actually. He, uh, he leads this championship despite having started one less race, one fewer races than everybody else in the field. He, uh, he skipped the race at, uh, was it Nazareth, Jennerstown? Jennerstown, Jennerstown I, I guess, believe. in order to go uh, to run a Bush North race because they both were on Saturday night. All right, here we go. Green is in the air, and Stefanik leads them down. The front straightaway at Watkins Glen. Lap 23, here comes Fuller. Fuller got a great run down in turn one, and Conley also getting by Hirschman. So put Fuller in front and Conley up in four spot. Watch the gravel, boys. Is that Hirschman off into the loose stuff? As the first four go freight training up into the S's, he gathered it back up. That's the second time today he's had to save that car, but Hirschman drops about four or five positions in the process. So here comes Stefanik, the six car, trying to get by Fuller, trying to draft by. Got a great run, got position, and he will take the spot. Keep this thing green, and these boys turn on a terrific show. Stefanik shows the way. Fuller second, a couple of past champions of the division. Leading, leading out into the fast stuff. Here's your fourth place guy, the tiny cap machine of Conley, trying to close up that gap, having put Hirschman behind him. And Leedy takes it. 
Takes a look and takes a run at Fuller. Has to fall back in. Up in the fifth spot now is, uh, I'll check that, that's still showing Hirschman there, and he has dropped back a couple of positions from that. It's going to be the 77 of John Preston rounding out the top five. Lady is all over Fuller. Can't make the move this time. Conley continuing to close that gap down to a couple of lengths of the modified. And they head for the S's. This is turn two. A right-hander will go up the hill. Turn left and three, back and four. And we'll go down the back stretch. Probably get up to 140, 50 miles per hour before they get to that inner loop. As Leedy trying to get a run on the 21 of Fuller. Can't do it. Meanwhile, Conley trying to close in. And there's, looks like Reggie Ruggiero back there trying to get another spot. He grabs a position. He's trying to get into the top 10. He is, that should make him 11th, I believe, with that pass. He started 19th, so he's going the right direction at least. Reg would love to see this thing stay green for a while so he can pass it. And Tim Harry in the double zero. And Leedy pushing Fuller down the back stretch. Suddenly, Stefanik seems to have a muscle. He opens up a pretty significant gap first of the day over Rick Fuller. Carl Pasteriak, one of the legends in this series, is off the pace and apparently headed for Pitt Road. Boy, he's been doing this a lot of years. Camera angle is a little deceiving. Watch the turn, and there you see the gap. Back to Fuller, call it three, perhaps four car lengths. Another three or four back to Leedy. That time, Fuller was a little bit faster than the leader, Stefanik, but not much. Conley not coming at him quite as quickly as we might have expected. Preston sitting back there in that fifth spot. Hirschman continuing to try to go forward from seventh. Here's eighth and ninth, which would be Sam Russo in a war with Camino. Camino. And Camino, the 17, takes it away. Carino, the young rising star of the division, looking for his first victory. He's been close a couple of times. Looks like Sam Russo has been able to get by the three car of Tony Hirschman. Hirschman trying to gather things up again after that off course excursion. There's Ruggiero fourth in line in that group, and this is bad news. Jamie Tomano is stuck in the dirt, and the caution flag is out. They don't back out of that gravel trap very effectively. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It stops the car, and typically it stays stopped. The last guy we saw in this situation was able to be pushed out and continue. I don't think he'll be able to put, be pushed out. I think we need a uh, the hook. Caution number four flying for the day. Jamie Tomano's been hammering away at this division since the division began. First shows up in the top ten of the points as the second rank driver. Or check that. First time was actually the first year of the tour, 1985, when he ranked in the sixth spot. Narrowly lost the championship to Jimmy Spencer and then came back and finally won the title in 1990. So he's been at it a long time. There's the 88 car, Sam Russo. Yes, he's moved into the seventh spot in front of the Tony Hirschman car. Sam Russo mows thousands of yards per week. Thousands. How's he get all that done? Well, I mean, he has several mow fast. Yeah, and he has Walker Mowers as his sponsor on his car, and he says they're the best, and he has a lot of people doing it, and thousands of yards each week. Let's find out more about Sam's day from Marty. Yeah, it's been an interesting weekend for Sam Russo. He started 16th and has moved up to 7th, as you guys pointed out. And what was interesting was we were talking to him before the race. He said, man, we are down about 200 RPM. I can't find out where it is. And he said he talked to a couple of the guys who really know Watkins Glen, and he found out that this is a momentum track, that you have to keep your momentum up. So he changed his braking pattern, changed the way he was going in and out of the corners, trying to carry more speed through rather than hogging it down and then jumping back on the throttle. It must be paying off. He's moved up nine spots. That's the thing that every race driver has to do well, adapt. 
Take the situation that you're handed, the cards that you're dealt, make the best of it. Sam's doing a great job of it right now. He's seventh. We'll be back. Here's a combination that uh, doesn't promote maximum traction. You can see the gravel that has been spread across the inner loop, the backstretch chicane here, as uh, more than one modified has had a wild excursion through there today. We need, gravel to get, is, uh, we need to get some brooms out there because not only traction, but those stones will puncture one of these bias ply tires. The guy who knows all about the gravel traps at Watkins Glen steps into the booth to join us, Mike Wallace. Had a tough day en route to 22nd uh, in the truck race today, but you found, you got kind of a mixed reaction, you tell me, to that gravel trap down at turn one. Well, I sure do, Dave. You know, the gravel traps at first, I didn't like them. Then I got to realizing that if, if I would have went on through the grass, I would have probably hit the wall pretty hard. And we left there with a straight truck. And, you know, the gravel tra traps are great. And normally you have driver error gets you into gravel traps, you know. So, uh -oh, uh -oh. as I told the guys, uh, <laughs> the driver made a major mistake today. Is that right? That's what happened to the... We're getting down to the just, heart of the matter now. Well, we just, we tried to move our braking point down about four more truck lengths, and uh, unfortunately, the thing started wheel hopping, getting down there in one, and you, know, you guys have seen that happen before, I'm sure. And, That's got to be a terribly helpless feeling. Well, it is, because there's just nothing you can do. You know, you try to get the wheel hop out, and by the time you get it out, and, uh, you know, the truck's turn sideways, and then the adhesion's gone, and uh, what happens, you get on the brakes real hard, and it starts chattering the rear end, and it loses its rear adhesion, and, uh, I think it's a good thing they put in there. You know, it's just once you get in them, you're frustrated because you can't get out right away. But talk to me about the whole business of road racing. I mean, how the how the truck, what are the trucks like on this racetrack, and do you, as a driver, enjoy this kind of competition? I actually had a wonderful time today. The only bad point of my whole day was when I was in the gravel trap. But uh, you know, the trucks drive very good here. We we didn't come here with what you say a real good road race truck. We just came with one of our trucks and. Uh, like I was telling Timmy Cahooth a little earlier with crew chief that we got to work on our brakes and things like that to, to be in a position to win the race. So we've talked, we're going to change all our braking system around to go to Sears Point and that, but in general, I don't know what it looked like from up top, you know, how the race went and all that from the fan view, but I had a good time out there today, you know, and uh, I think the trucks are very suitable for this race truck. It was pretty exciting because Ron Fellows, you know, like you, uh, mm -hmm. felt like he could not make it on fuel, so he stopped was leading the race and stopped and I think 16 trucks stopped so that meant that uh, at least 18 trucks were left on the racetrack well it's maybe 16 because a couple might have been out so he has to restart at best 17th 18th and worked his way through the field back to the front so it's pretty pretty impressive job yeah that's that's where my major brain fade come out I got fellows and Hornaday stuck behind some lap trucks and put about a half a straight one that short shoot on fellows and I thought okay we're moving to the front here now and it's gonna make up as much time as we could and uh, try to get a little too aggressive too quick <laughs> check this big bro this big broom they've got over here that thing will move some gravel we got a jet blower a jet engine to blow the rocks off the racetrack i suggest that corner worker get out of the way because those <laughs> things will come flying across there in a big hurry he's right behind the zippo sign and they fired the jet up and uh there he goes those babies would be zippoing through there if they were on the other side of it. <laughs> All right. So as you look ahead, you see this truck thing as a, as a future? You want it to do a lot more of this? Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm having a good time right now. You know, my desire is still to get back Winston Cup racing someday, yep. but I'm only going to do that in the right situation where I can win at. And... Uh, I got a great group of guys right here with Schrader Racing. They want me to be here, and uh, you know the way things look right now, I'm probably going to end up running the trucks for another year, unless something in the next three, four weeks comes about Winston Cup wise. But all the real good teams that are capable of winning, are, you know, are already got drivers in them. Well, this is great. Why can't I pick this thing up? You see that? <laughs> <laughs> Who's standing on this thing? <laughs> He's having a big time. Speed Week, of course, wraps up all the world of uh, racing on. Friday night, they cover the whole gamut at uh, just past midnight Eastern time, 9.30 out on the left coast. How does this thing work, anyway? Extra special what? 90. 90. I'm not sure I understand that one. We've got Marty busy down on track side to uh, bring us up to date on what's happening on pit road. Yeah, I'm down here with Mike Stefanik's crew chief, Barry Cunell. Has he said anything on the radio? No, uh, the car feels pretty good. We're going to just try to cruise and stay in the front, and then uh, with a few to go, let it loose, you know? 
with all the intermittent yellows, uh, is it, has he said anything about the rhythm of the race or complaining about anything? Yeah, it's hard to get in a rhythm. That's what you need here is to put some laps on so you get in the sink, you know, and with all the cautions, it breaks that all the time. So now it takes a couple laps to get back in it. Well, the early go, you were sitting back in third and letting everybody up front just pass each other back and forth, saving the tires. Now with uh, the laps winding down, we got about 10 to go. You're going to turn him loose, aren't you? Yeah, he's free now. All right, there's the word. Loosen the reins and turn him loose. Stefanik knows how to win on this racetrack. We're getting ready to go green. The lights are out on the face truck. We're set for a charge. Is that how you know it's a Chevrolet that says so on the roof of the car? That must be <laughs> it. Ah, I got you. Change the paint job, change the brand. There's some bizarre story about the, the configuration of the roof at one point had to be the same as a production automobile, and that was, uh, I don't know, who cares? They're fast, they're fun, and they're back under green at Watkins Glen. Let's keep it green to the end and see who's the fastest cat out here. Fuller taking a look. And Ooh. almost makes contact with the batting. Yeah, Mike didn't want to let that pass happen very badly, but you sure don't want to step over there and touch that left front, or you'd be in big trouble. Let's see if Stefani can draft by down the back stretch or front stretch, whichever going into turn five. And boy, does he get a great run off the S's. And here he goes for the lead. It's going to be a gimme putt. Well, Fuller's not going to let it go easily, but Stefani has the line lead. He tried to go with him. No room as Fuller slams the door. Leedy in third, Conley chasing in the yellow car from fourth. Great battle. Terrific battle. Now Fuller tries to get himself back, see if he can catch that six car. Car in front, Mike Stefanik has been the dominant car in the NASCAR Featherlight Modified Tour this year. How many races have he won? Six or something? Six races. One on a tear, won five in a row, and six out of seven. Guy builds his own race cars. I wondered what the big difference between this year and last year was. And now nobody was admitting anything. Just a lot of smiling and say, well, you know, we work on the thing. We develop it. It gets better all the time. And when we get something good, we're the only ones that have got it. Conley having a look from fourth. And Lee goes to the corner. Thought he got it too hard, but did not go in too hard. Saves the car. And we see right now that Leedy is losing contact with the front two is Fuller closing on the back bumper of Stefani. That's interesting too because the last time they hit the inner loop, Leedy was trying to slide through and get into second spot. Now look at the gap. And here goes Fuller, battle for the lead. And meanwhile, Connor's got a challenge behind him. Charge is on. Mikey Winitsko is moving as he gets inside the top five. Here's the focus. Fuller and Stefanik, two of the legendary names in this division, continue to beat on each other for the lead. Stefanik, the two-time champion. Fuller, the top cat in 1993. Conn was able to hold off, and here comes Stefanik. Turn 10, the left-hander, and he takes the lead back. Boy, a great race this Just year. terrific competition. What do you think, Mike? You ready to jump in one of these babies? Well, I, I tell you what, you know what's amazing me is the draft on these modifieds are a whole lot more effective than like what the trucks are here. You know, you don't really feel the draft on a truck that much. And it appears here you want to be running second when you enter turn 10 at the final lap. <laughs> if you could get that pass made before start finish, of course, that is the bottom line. And we're getting down close to that end. We predicted at the top it would be decided at the checker. And boy, when we've been green, I don't think I've seen better competition this year. These guys are just all over each other, swapping the lead like crazy. Leedy is right back in the thick of it, and now it's Conley who seems to be having trouble keeping the pace. Here's Fuller again as they go up the back shoe. And Fuller will take that lead again. Anytime these cars get straight and run 125 miles per hour, somebody's going to get passed. There goes Iwanitsko, and following him is uh, John Preston, who's lost the spot. Back in the seventh position, Sam Russo at 88 gets some challenge from Dan Avery in the seventh. Hirschman is the blue car back in the middle of that. He was top five early on, nearly ran and did in fact run off the course, gathered it back up, and the defending champion now sits back there in eighth spot in the blue number three. Here's the focus up front. Fuller was trying to break the draft on Stefanik. And somebody off the gravel behind dirt back there. Looks like 
Able to make it through okay, and Conley is now caught back up with Leedy. The Mystic Missile is on the move. Bob Garbarino's yellow car out of Mystic, Connecticut. That car's been around a long time in this division. A lot of great drivers have piloted it. But right now, Conley is playing catch-up as they battle for the lead here at Watkins Glen. The view from the cockpit for Conley is not good. The car in front of him is Mikey Winitsko, and Iwanitsko is now the fourth place car. There he makes the left hander. The yellow car is Conley, and he has dropped the spot to the tail end of the top five. He's now being pressured by John Preston, and that's the race for fifth and sixth. And believe it or not, Mike Stefanik still leads the race. There has not been a battle for the lead since we've gone to commercial break as Preston gets on the inside, takes his spot away from Connolly. Something has definitely gone south for Connolly. I wonder if all that scrapping up front wore the tires out, Benny. I would guess the engine is gone south. Looks like he's doing okay this morning, but he just isn't accelerating. That's why you're the expert analyst. Meanwhile, up front, look at this, Stefanik. Nobody told him the commercial break is over. He just continues to truck as the gap now is perhaps three modified lengths back to Fuller. Fuller, with the laps winding down, working 35, needs to go in a hurry. Let's get an update on Conley from Marty. Yeah, guys, I talked to the crew. You're dead spot on as far as the tires. They think, he hasn't said anything on the radio, they too believe the tires are going away. Too much battle in that for early go. Ewan Ensko inherits the fourth spot, and now Preston is all over Conley. It looks like he is running down the trend okay, that it could be a, I thought he was getting through the corners okay and he was losing ground on the straightaways, but that time, it looked like his straightaway speed was okay. Conley's a big guy, 210 pounder, and not afraid to throw that car around. But perhaps throwing it around early costs him late. As we get into the final three laps, here's another challenge from Preston. From Wyalusing, Pennsylvania, the Chase Motors Chevrolet for a top five spot. Great battle. Last time by, Stefanik, the leader, was the fastest car of the top six. But not much. Rick Fuller. Never see Preston round. once again. Trying to make a move. Can't do it. Preston got around him once, but Conley was able to come right back and retaliate in the next corner. Now the battle continues. Preston right there, tucked up underneath the tail. A great view out the back. Long, high-speed straightaways where the ramp really works on these cars. Two to go. Coming by this time, he will get the signal. Will Stefanik, two laps to go. And he's pulling away. Yeah, and Leedy is nowhere in sight as the money laps away. And Stefanik has put the hammer down. You see, this could be a season best for Preston as he sits at sixth. His best previous was seventh. In the lead swap fest last week. Mike Stefanik looking for victory number seven. Uh oh, he uh -oh. got a car that's slow. Ed Kennedy. Ed Kennedy, Ed Kennedy the zero car. And the caution flag is out. It will be a shootout. We got a car stopped just at the exit to turn 12 as they were turning for what would have been the white flag. Bert Marvin's car turned the wrong way and is facing traffic. Well, guess what? I don't think these cars cannot end the race on the caution flag. So I think we're going to see green, white, checker, and maybe this is what Rick Fuller needs to catch up with Stefanik. We will, in other words, see a whole lot more excitement before this one is over. Well, Stefanik will not be thrilled about that because he drove what I felt was a very strategic race, saving the car for when it mattered, turning it loose with 10 to go, building a lead. But now, Fuller, Leedy, Iwanitsko, and Conley get another shot. Back at Watkins Glen, where Burke Marvin has climbed out of the SGM Enterprises and Zarkowski Builders Chevrolet, he having contributed to the most recent 
yellow flag, which would be caution at number five here on lap 37. That sets up the potentially dramatic finish. I don't see any circumstances under which this will not be a dramatic finish based on what we saw earlier in the race. I don't think so either. You know, if it were a Winston Cup race, the race would be over when the cars get to the start finish line. And Stefanik would be the winner. But folks, this is not a Winston Cup race. This is a Featherlight modified race, and they do not end the race on the caution flag. Went to a uh, green-white checker situation a week ago at Lout, where they had that lead swapping battle. It was won by leading. And I don't know, but let me guess, they had a big break. I would guess they had a big break. I mean, that's I wouldn't be at all surprised. <laughs> that might have been what, the, <laughs> what, what prompted that. Here's Preston. Had a good day, a potential season's best finish here. You wonder if in fact Conley's problem was that the tires were going away, if this opportunity to cool them off might give him something for one last shot. It's going to be tough for anybody to deal with Stefanik, but Fuller's been good on restarts. He has been good. And these tires, Conley's tires might be cooling off. He may make a run at Iwanisco and Leedy, but I think he's got too far to go to get back all the way to the front. They take a heck of a move, but even Itzko gets an opportunity here to uh, perhaps crack the podium. He's just inside the top four for the first time today, having recently gotten around Conley. Had a good run in the uh, in the truck race to 21st place. Got to mix it up with Mike Wallace and others. Russo doing well here today from 16th to 7th. He's gone forward all day. Buy a couple new lawnmowers with the prize money. Let's go to Marty and uh, find out what we can about this last lap shootout that's shaping up here. Well, we already talked to the, the race leader, Mike Stefanik's crew chief. Let's go to Art Barry, who's crew chief on uh, the 21 car. And I got to ask you, he's done real well on the restarts, being able to pass him into one, but he hadn't been able to hold him off on the back stretch. You got anything left? Well, Ricky's going to try, but we got a slight skip on the restarts, and it hurts us until he gets going. So uh, we don't know. We just got to hope for the best here. You got any tires left? Oh, yeah, he said the car feels great. It's just that we pick up that miss in the motor as she has a high RPM. All right, guys, we still got a shootout to come. Well, it's interesting because a couple of times we have seen him uh, make the move on Stefanik and earlier when he was racing with Conley to go right to the front, make the pass going into turn one. He needs to do that when we come back for the final restart of the day. Stay tuned. We're back, and we are down to it. A green flag, a lap, a white flag, a lap, and a checkered flag to decide who's going to take home the majority of the money here in the Rumbles 150. A two-lap shootout to decide it for the NASCAR Featherlight Modified Division. The race leader, Mike Stefanik, looking for his seventh victory of the season and the 42nd of his career. He leads the championship in this division. He is second in the Bush North Championship. He's just having an amazing season. And today, well, it's going to be an amazing finish. Well, right now, can Fuller stay close enough? I know Stefanik wants to get a good jump on this restart. He's going to nail the gas and try to drive away. He nailed it. Is he driving away? Oh, man, what happened back there? Even this is a terrible start. Even Itzko just didn't get any kind of a jump. Stefanik did a great job, and whether Fuller was hanging back or whether it was that little skip in the motor, he went nowhere on the restart. There's the gap back to third place. Leedy, then Iwanitsko, then Conley, and John Preston. So nobody made a move on the restart. With a lap of three quarters to go, they head up the hill for the next good passing opportunity, which is the entrance to the inner loop, the chicane at the end of the back shoe. Here they come, Stefanik trying to block that drafting move by Fuller, and he will hold the lead in the inner loop this time. Next time by, we'll get the white flag. Fuller will get it all wound up to get past that little stumble of the motor and prepare for one last shot at the leader, Stefanik. This is your battle for the championship. Stefanik and Fuller, 120 points apart in the rankings and two car lengths apart on the racetrack. Fuller pulling off pass after pass early in the race. 
has a lap and a corner left if he's going to pull off one more and claim the victory and the ruffles 150. What do you think, Benny? Can he get around him? Doesn't look that way. Looks to me like Stefanik is simply driving away from Rick Buller. You see the gap back to lead him. Careful there, Stefanik gets the wheel off just at the turn-in point. Kicked up a little dust, but no harm done. Buller uses all the road as he exits off turn one. Now the charge up the hill. If Fuller's got something, he's got a showing now. Leedy not in a position to challenge. And the 77 of Preston has gotten around Conley. John's inside the top five. Here they come into the interloop for the final time. Stefanik showing the way. Fuller could not make a move. Stefanik with a few car lengths. Can he get enough draft down the back stretch on this left-hander? Not going to happen, is it? Doesn't appear this that way. Last good opportunity is at the breaking point for this next left-hander. Mike Stefanik got him covered as they turn in, stand back on the gas, and head for home. The Ruffles 150 about to go into the history book, and it will be the seventh victory of 1997 for Mike Stefanik. He wins it by a couple of car lengths over Rick Fuller, who pulls up alongside to wave in congratulations. What an amazing season for the Burnham Bunch and car number X6. Celebration begins here at Watkins Glen, where Stefanik, starting from the pole, a busy weekend, left here last night, went over to Agawam, Massachusetts, to Riverhead Stadium, led the thing down to 25 laps to go, lost the lead to Dave Dion, finished second, consolidated his hold on second place in the Bush North, comes back up here today and wins the race to extend his lead in the NASCAR Featherlight Tour Championship standings. That's not a bad weekend's work. Not a bad weekend. We've apparently had a car go off and uh, slap one of the styrofoam barriers here on the last lap. Driver's out and okay, but the car is buried in the plastic down there. I can't tell you who it is. Well, those things are a great help here at Watkins Glen. Combine those with the gravel trap and you save an awful lot of hardware at this place. We tore up a bunch of good cars here last year. Also, there we see the car going in the, this is not the same crash that we we're talking about. That's uh, Carvino, isn't it? And no, I don't think Carvino has a red car, I believe. Well, John that, Preston it was that must be Preston on the last lap. Yeah, sure enough. Preston, who had gotten into fifth, worked his way around Tim Conley, got a little excited and let it get away from him on the last left-hander, went through the gravel trap, and as a result, fell to 10th place. So it was an eventful last lap and an exciting finish and a great day and a great weekend for the winner, Mike Stefanik. We'll hear from him when we come back. ESPN2 coverage of the Ruffles 150 brought to you by Haviland Formula 3 Motor Oil. Add more life to your car been an exciting day here at Watkins Glen. The winner has arrived in victory lane to be met, not by this guy, but by Marty. Yeah, and he's climbing out after getting a swallow of Gatorade and a big smile with victory number seven. Listen to the crowd. Oh, Michael. Wow. Hey. Victory number seven, patient early, aggressive late. Nice drive. Yeah, you, you that pretty much sums it up. Them guys are dicing it up. I said, man, it's way too early. Uh, I know everybody wants to get the TV coverage and this and that, but I had to be right over here, and I didn't want to go off course or get bumped or anything. Not that anything would happen, but you never know. So it seems everybody was good on restarts, and uh, when they had their tires nice and fresh, but uh, he's good your tires on this chassis here. We just uh, we had a nice race set up, and uh, it went better as the race went on, but we had so many cautions. I apologize to all the race fans, but I'll tell you, we had a lot of fun with Rick. Rick would get me on a restart every time. I said, what kind of gear you got in that thing? But, uh, you know, we'd battle back and forth, and, he, you know, I'd get it back on the back stretch. It, He's a gentleman to race with. I really enjoyed it today, and it was just, uh, we had a little bit better chassis on the longer run. Well, you did a great job. Uh, it, it, has this been the kind of year, did you ever expect to be second in the Bush North points and leading here and have all these victories? 
I know. It's been an outstanding year. I got to thank Burnham. They sponsored both these cars. The crews do a great job. All them couch potatoes back home on the bush side there. They raced last night. So I got to thank Bob Fry, my pilot. He buzzes me back and forth from Karis Air. He does a fantastic job, makes this all possible. These guys get all the credit. I, I give them very little practice time. I mean, I took like 10 laps in his car y yesterday, and it's hard when I don't give them a really a fair shot, but they just dig down deep, and they never put a frown on, and uh, hey, it feels great to win it for them and, and for all our fans and for Burnham. Victory number seven here for Mike Stefanik at Watkins Glen. Stan Stefanik's victory total for his career rising to 42 now. Give a call to Tim Airy, who got into the top five on the last lap with the misfortune for Preston, who slipped to the tail end of the top ten after that off-course excursion. The defending champion, Hirschman, sits there in seventh spot. How about Tommy Baldwin finishes in 11th spot? Tony Ferranti up to 13th. And look at Neri, finishes 14th after starting 28th. Russo had trouble late, ends up back in 18th spot. Take you on back through the rest of the field. Bordwick, of course, stopped the race by clobbering the wall. After starting 18th, he'll be credited with 27 points. And these are the guys who went nowhere today, having trouble early. The runner-up, Rick Fuller, let's hear from him. Yeah, we're down there. He's got a good smile on his face. Uh, the, the crew told us that the, the car was skipping there at the end on the restart. They're doing it again, aren't they? They, it's, they see these cameras on pit road, and they're like, wow, this is just like when the cup guys are in town. Let's tell them there's something wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you, I can't. <laughs> they're just something else. Um, well, was there a problem, or was it you just didn't have enough horses? Um, the car ran great. We got a we got a, uh, a performance motor in this thing, and it, it did a super job for us. Um, you know, the Goodyear brought a good tire, and uh, you know, we Sunoco and Polar and all of our sponsors were real happy for them. You know, Tim Tim's got the in-car TV, and we hog all of that by being in front of him. Then I don't know. I I think he was hungry. He <laughs> there he goes off the racetrack to get a hot dog. Who knows? Um, but uh, we had a real good time. You know, Mike's a class act. He he really is. And. Um, it, uh, it just, it's a blast to race with him. Congratulations, great run, second place, Rick Fuller. A lot of mutual respect between the first and second place finishers there. It's fun to have Mike Wallace come up and join us here in the booth. Benny, a quick final thought. Again, great race, a lot of caution flag last day, but while they were racing on the green, it was a terrific race. Mike Stefanik, King of the Hill. See ya.